the most spiritually material of the Muslims would be uh, people who say that, well, you know, um, the Quran is, is literally true in every detail, and, and time doesn't change anything. So the model here, let's say that it is a pool of water, but it is static. Now, at the same time, when that school emerged, there were other schools that saw the revelation as a river. They saw that it was flowing. And, and they gave lots of evidence for that, evidence in the Quran. Just one example would be, slavery is allowed, but God really doesn't seem to like slavery. Because as we read in the Quran, we see, so apparently right now, it's permissible, but it's very clear from all the statements that he doesn't like slavery. Therefore, we have no reason to continue this institution, even though it was around in the time of the Prophet, peace be upon him. So what's happened is, with the, the failure of um, third world economies, third world states, um, with, with competing ideologies, the, the tolerant ideology that treasured the, the, the presence of the Jews and the Christians living in um, countries dominated by Muslims, those were, um, those were people who over centuries had seen, because not all of them did, the ones who gained power, they saw the religion as a river that, that stressed mercy and cooperation. And also, all we have to do is look at the Islamic expansion, where a great many people very quickly became the dhimmi class. So they paid taxes and they had protection. And then this led to all kinds of collaborations. You have other events, other fanatical events, called one like called the Inquisition. And very many of the Jews, hundreds of thousands of them, were invited into Turkey. The Turks aren't dumb, you know. They want uh, the, the the Sultan wanted a, a Jewish doctor and a Jewish dentist, you know. So <laughs> and all of the science coming from Spain and everything. So there were huge numbers of them invited into a Muslim country, and I myself uh, took took um, recording equipment uh, only uh, only 10, 15 years ago to Istanbul to interview the Jewish community there to see how they felt. Now, at that time, they were still quite delighted. I doubt that would be true now. Things have changed enough there, and I doubt they would be universally as happy there. Uh, we, we have to understand, uh, to get back, we, as, as, as Americans, need to better understand what has happened. And Muslims, in particular, I think, need to understand and speak up and understand who has taken control and how they did it. What is their ideology? Uh, they are materialists. They are materialists is what they are. And their material is, uh, is a sofa called heaven. You see, they have no reason to like this world. And, and there's nothing in the Quran that would be changed today. So you wonder why they want modern weapons. You know, why don't they use swords? You see, they want the modern weapons, but they don't want See, they don't want the stuff that they think conflicts with their materialist agenda for the sofa. But, so, so we have this, these, these actual materialists using the language of Islam, and meanwhile, the, the other end of the scale are the, the Sufis saw the Quran as, as a river that ran into an ocean that rose into the sky and rained upon the land. Sufis saw, saw, saw the Quran in a very, very different way. They, they saw it as the totality. And Ibn Arabi annoys the grammarians by saying that the Quran comes from Qarana, to join, rather than to recite. So he says, you should become a Quran. See? You should join everything in yourself and become a Quran. Join transcendence and imminence and so on. It'd be hard to get these people to accept the Sufi view. I think we can't really aim for that. But we can aim for what you were talking about, which is to, to uh, those of us who are older than, than 55 or something, we remember when everybody was going in Volkswagen vans 
through all of these countries and sleeping on the side of the road and getting invited into houses and having the best time of their lives through all these countries now where their throats would be cut. So, you know, it's a really different world. And it's absurd to think that this is the thing that Americans have to remember is, hey, wake up, you know, isn't there any historical memory here? This is a new thing in, 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 its, in its large scale manifestation. So it's like, a, it's like a bacterium that, given the right environment, it suddenly becomes truly infectious. And that's what has happened. It was there. It's not that it wasn't there. It's definitely in an interpretation of Islam that, that we, should, we should challenge and we should understand. So in order to challenge it, we have to understand it. That's what I'm trying to say. We have to understand the metaphysics and the theology and the history. So if we want the world to change, we have to know more. And we have to share more. We have to be willing to share and, and talk and, and question. Or we're going to have a, it's going to give rise to a fascist government in our own country. Fascism begets fascism. So, so to get back there, in, in all cases that we can do anything individually, we should do it. And when we can reach larger audiences, we should do it. Uh, and from both sides, we should do it. I deliberately started the talk with the notion of the Imago Dei. And in my talk, I spoke about its Jewish origins. <coughs> um, so you have the idea of Adam being created upon the divine image, meaning the human being. And, and this comes into Christianity and comes into Islam. This is the shared vision of <coughs> the spirituality of direct experience in all of those three traditions. And in Buddhism, they call it by different names and so forth. So we, we, should, we should emphasize that there's a very optimistic view of the human being that is, that is well outside of dogmatism and such. And, and I think that's where we could begin.